When I first heard about The Hunger Games, I wasn't actually interested in reading the book or watching the movie because I thought it would be a literal competition of who could be hungry for the longest and participants just wouldn't be given any food. <laughs> but then I learned that it's a tournament where teenagers are forced to kill each other and only one remains and is the winner. And I thought, wow, actually, that sounds super fun and interesting. I was 15. It's a very exciting concept, the death tournament. You either win or you die. It's extremely high stakes, it's action, it's fun. And I love The Hunger Games. I will praise that series until the day that I die. Hopefully not in a death tournament. And a lot of other stories have tried to replicate the success of The Hunger Games by taking this death tournament trope and running with it to varying degrees of success. This video may or may not have been inspired by me recently reading a death tournament book that I was severely disappointed by, um, and so I wanted to do a little deep dive into it. And that's gonna be this video, a deep dive into the death tournament trope. Where did it come from? Why do we love it so much? How is it done well? And aren't we all just filthy capital people for enjoying it? By the way, if you hear screaming in the background of this video, there's a fairground going on all week, pretty much right next to where I live. <laughs> I swear that's the reason. And there's really nothing I can do about the sound, so we're just gonna pretend it's a set design, audio set design for this video about death tournaments. People screaming in the background. Great. Okay, let us begin by answering the question, where does this trope come from? When I say death tournament, I specifically mean a tournament where all the participants have to kill each other. It's a fight to the death and the winner is the last man surviving. And the official term for this trope is actually the Battle Royale, named after the 1919 book Battle Royale by Koshin Takami, which was made into a movie in 2000. Battle Royale by Koshin Takami is a dystopian story where youth delinquency is at its peak, teenagers are no longer listening to their teachers at all and as punishment every year one group of middle schoolers one class of middle schoolers is chosen to go on a school trip to this deserted island this uninhabitable island where they are then forced to kill each other until one of them wins and this is as punishment of the adults to the teenagers for being so unruly. The title of this book has popularized the term battle royale. The term battle royale has come to mean a fictional genre with a death tournament. Examples of fiction are The Hunger Games, The Purge, Alice in Borderland, Squid Game, Danganronpa, and books that I recently read that are also quite popular is The Serpent and the Wings of Night, a very popular romance fantasy, um, and Immortal Longings, a book by the best-selling author Chloe Gong. But you may also know the term Battle Royale from games because it has become an incredibly popular game genre where participants are all kind of thrown together in this arena and they all have to kill each other, you know, in game and you win by being the last man standing. Examples being, of course, Fortnite, uh, but also some Call of Duty games and Fall Guys. Now, I don't have a lot of experience, if any experience, with games like this, but I heard that apparently in a lot of these Battle Royale games, the map progressively get smaller as the game goes on to kind of force more people together in the same area. And I recently watched the Battle Royale movie and that is also something that exactly happens in the movie where the map progressively gets smaller so that the surviving teenagers are forced to kind of meet each other on the island. Also a little side note, I know there's been like a lot of discussion about Susan Collins plagiarizing Battle Royale for the Hunger Games because the concept is so similar. Also, if you watch, I haven't read the book again, but if you watch the movie, it's so similar to the Hunger Games in so many ways. And I'm not really gonna go into that discussion. I just want to say that Susan Collins claims that she had never heard of Battle Royale um, before she published the Hunger Games. 
But first, do you also often sit behind your desk like a little goblin? I did for years, and I have been looking for a way to make my home office situation better for so long. So I'm super happy that this video is sponsored by FlexiSpot. They aim to create affordable and high quality products. I received the FlexiSpot Pro Plus Standing Desk E7. This is an excellent desk with adjustable height so you can turn it into a standing desk. When I'm sitting down, I can perfectly adjust the height of the desk so that my shoulders can relax and feel nice. And then when I want to stand up, because I've been sitting all day, it's just one button press away. I'm very impressed with how smooth the mechanism is and how well the buttons respond to the touch. And the whole thing was genuinely super easy to assemble. You can choose the aesthetics of the hardware yourself and I chose a white frame with a light bamboo desktop. The desk has a 30 day return policy and 15 year warranty so you can try it out with confidence. FlexiSpot also has the more affordable standing desk E5 available and the basic standing desk E2 that you can get for $200. You can get your FlexiSpot E7 for the best price possible using this exclusive code. And I will also leave a link in the description. So check that out as well. Okay, so now we know that the book Battle Royale has given the term Battle Royale its modern meaning of the death tournament fiction trope. I kind of want to dive into the history of the Battle Royale. Koshi and Takami did not make up the concept of Battle Royale, it's an already existing concept from our history. Now, when people think of real world examples of the Hunger Games or Battle Royale style fights, people often mention gladiator fights. Maybe this is because of the saying panem et circenses that is popularized by the Hunger Games, referring to this phrase that originated in Rome, meaning bread and circuses. The saying refers to how governments would use very superficial provisions and entertainment, that being bread and circuses in ancient Rome, to gain political approval. In the Hunger Games, this is what the Hunger Games itself served as for the citizens. It was the entertainment Aside from being like punishment for the people, The Hunger Games was also entertainment to distract the people, especially the people in the capital, from all the wealth inequality that's going on in the world of The Hunger Games. And because of this like Latin saying, I think people often think about like gladiator fights when they think of historical examples of Hunger Games style tournaments. But I don't actually think that gladiator duels are an accurate comparison to this Hunger Games style battle royale because it's more like a duel you know it's usually man versus man or man versus animal instead of this free-for-all that categorizes the battle royale. Instead the battle royale seems to have its origins in sports. Before it was known as a story trope battle royale was a real term in wrestling and boxing. There's actually an excerpt in the book Battle Royale about pro wrestling. A character says, with Battle Royale, 10 or 20 wrestlers all jump into the ring and then you're free to attack anyone, one-on-one -on -one or 10 against one, it doesn't matter. In any case, the ones who fall lose. They have to leave the ring. Then there's only one player left in the ring and he's the winner. Which makes me believe that this is where the author of Battle Royale has the term Battle Royale from and maybe even got his idea. So Battle Royale sports matches have existed since the 18th century, early versions being more like free-for-all boxing matches. They were usually public events to serve as entertainment for a very excited audience and they were very very popular for a few decades. Here's an example of an advertisement from 1743 in the amphitheater in Oxford Street that says there will be a battle royal between the noted buckhorse and seven or eight more. And for a few decades this style of wrestling and boxing was very popular, but then towards the end of the 18th century, the popularity dwindled a bit as the British looked at the tradition and thought to themselves, actually, 
We are way more posh than this. This is way too dangerous for a civilized place such as the wonderful United Kingdom. And so it moved overseas to the American colonies, where the battle royale boxing matches took on a very different kind of history. In the American colonies, battle royale boxing matches were still popular, but it was very specifically a type of boxing match where black men and boys would be paid to fight each other. Some context on the time period of these battle royales in the United States. It was introduced in the 18th century, where they were most popular among enslaved people. Then battle royales became popular again during the reconstruction to as late as the 20th century when black people in the US were no longer enslaved but the Jim Crow laws and segregation were still very present. A PBS film about the battle royal beginnings of African-American boxer Jack Johnson describes the events as follows. One of the most humiliating creations of the Jim Crow era, the Battle Royal. A backroom spectacle in which six or eight or ten black boys, often blindfolded, were set to punching one another while drunken white men jeered them on. The last one standing got the prize, usually a fistful of tossed coins. These battle royals were very popular on carnivals, fairgrounds, festivals, and they were kind of seen not as like a very professional boxing thing, but more as like a comical event, something to laugh at. And they were often advertised specifically about the fact that this was black people fighting each other. Sometimes even having special seats reserved for white patrons in the audience. In my research, I found that there seems to be a narrative in some places that the black participants actually really enjoyed these fights. Um, or that it was actually beneficial to them because some people have used it to establish their uh, professional boxing careers. And although this did happen, like for example, um, the boxer Jack Johnson started out his career in these battle royals, let's not understate the humiliating nature of these kinds of um, events. Franklin Hughes writes in an article for the Jim Crow Museum at Ferris State University, most often the battle royal was a comedic mockery and provided the participants with little more than the opportunity to be laughed at and ridiculed. This is all exemplified by the fact that sometimes the participants were blindfolded for no other reason than that it would, I guess, create more chaos and is therefore like more fun to watch. Descriptions of these boxing events include, this is all from like advertisements and flyers, comical boxing bout with a comical exhibition of a battle royal between five black people who pummeled each other with large boxing gloves. Battle royal to set the fans in a cheery mood. An hour full of fun, wild swings, haymakers, uppercuts, amusing, ludicrous, free fun for everybody. So it's clear that during these events, the participants were very much reduced to something to ridicule, something to laugh at. And because of that, it's the audience members that position themselves as superior, as the ones that are laughing at the inferior people in the ring. And I think this is a good example of how entertainment and like laughing and being laughed at is something that very often has very political underpinnings you know like who is the person being laughed at and who is the person laughing who is seen as inferior and who is seen as superior in this specific example it was very clear that black people were still seen as inferior by white people who enjoyed laughing at them. So that was the, I think, often forgotten history of the Battle Royale. I think now when people think of Battle Royale, they uh, only think of the Japanese book and that like being the beginnings of it. But I just thought it would be interesting and also important to share the other history that is behind this word and this trope and where the idea originally came from. Now, of course, originally the Battle Royale term, whether referring to just like the friendly boxing matches in the UK or the very racist boxing matches in America, they weren't to the death. 
I didn't mention that. I hope you all understood that. Like they weren't to the death. It was just like until you fall and so you've like lost in boxing. But this whole like to the death thing, that is a very key aspect that Koshun Takami at it and that is how he really turned this term battle royale into what we recognize it as today the death tournament so are we all capital people when we enjoy a battle royale game or story or movie when we are watching the hunger games aren't we all basically just the capital people that are enjoying the entertainment of young people slaughtering each other when we enjoy stories with this trope loving the tension and the action are we not exactly what suzanne collins is criticizing i do think it's important to of course note that it is fictional so we're not actually laughing at real people dying we're not actually forcing anyone to fight each other to the death but i do think it gives a lot of context to this trope to know how these kind of battle royales were used in the past to make a mockery of certain groups of people people who were deemed inferior whether that is like black people but also when you think of like gladiators you know normal gladiators usually didn't die during gladiator fights these like death fights between gladiators were usually um for slaves and prisoners and like criminals those were the ones that were usually executed in the ring again because these people were deemed inferior and so was fun little entertainment of watching them die Things like racism or class divisions really show when you start having a tournament where you laugh at the violence or death of others. By the way, don't get me wrong, this video is not me trying to make the point that it's immoral to enjoy death tournament tropes. Not at all. Not at all. I just think it's interesting how history shows that battle royal tournaments are often actually very political and a display of power. It's a very important question. Who is the one laughing and who is the one being laughed at? And these kind of tournaments often exemplified the existing power dynamics in that society, whether that is racism or certain class division. And I think in order for a story to do the death tournament trope well, the story needs to be like aware of it and kind of use the death tournament to show these power dynamics that exist in the fictional world. And you can very easily tell when a story has a death tournament just for funsies and like the cool action of it all. But we'll get to uh, what makes death tournaments work. Let's first go into why we actually enjoy this trope so much. I think the tournament part is very obvious. It's just fun to watch a tournament. Like, <laughs> we love competitions. I always feel like tournaments in fantasy books especially are just the fantasy version of sports. Like, there's not usually, like, sports in fantasy novels. So instead, you have magical tournaments. I think a magical tournament slash competition in a fantasy book scratches the same itch as, like, a sports trope would in a contemporary book. Except in contemporary sports stories, of course, the stakes aren't a life or death. Unless you are the all for the game series. <laughs> Always the exception. So I think it makes sense why we like tournaments in books. Uh, but what about the death part? The death part is kind of new, introduced by Battle Royale, the book, popularized by the Hunger Games, and now a pretty common fantasy trope. In a Barnes & Noble article by Eric Smith recommending books with dangerous games, Smith says, they're thrilling and exciting and show us what happens in the face of a terrifying absolute power. I really think the biggest difference between a normal tournament and the death tournament, it, it's really just the tension. Like, you could die. Like, the stakes are pretty high here. And it's not just because only one survivor wins, there's this really big risk that the main character, like the character that you're following, doesn't make it. But also, it's the fact that your main character is forced to kill. Tension doesn't just come from the risk of a character getting killed, it's seeing a character having to kill other people that also immediately adds tension. So I think like death tournaments are like free tension and stakes 
for your story. Also, because there's only one winner, you might know that your main character is probably going to make it because, of course, they're the main character. But what about their allies? What about the friends that they're making? What about the person they might be falling in love with? Romance! Romance! <laughs> so many romance options! <laughs> You know, all death tournament stories have that, what I would like to call, um, how will they both survive moment. Either the love interest is going to die, which is not fun, or you have to ask yourself, wait, how are they both gonna survive this? It's free stakes and tension. But yeah, you can very clearly tell when an author just uses the death tournament for the free stakes and tension, um, because then the rest of the story tends to kind of fall apart. So let's talk about that now. What are some examples of death tournaments that I think are very well done and how do they fail? There's kind of two aspects where I think a lot of death tournament stories go wrong. The first one is you need to have a really, really, really good answer to the question, why on earth would anyone willingly participate in a death tournament? The characters really need to be very, very desperate in order to willingly put themselves in a position where they not only highly risk getting killed, they also have to kill other people. I think this is why good examples of death tournaments often have characters just being forced into the tournament. Like in the Hunger Games, the oppressive government forces people from the districts to enter the Hunger Games as a punishment for a revolution in the past. In Battle Royale, the adults force middle schoolers into this death tournament as punishment for all the youth delinquency and the insubordination towards teachers. So the characters aren't voluntarily joining the tournament. Instead, there's usually some kind of authorial figure that has a good reason, some kind of motivation for forcing people to kill each other. Some good examples of stories where the characters are not forced into this tournament. Uh, the first one is actually also The Hunger Games because, of course, Katniss Everdeen, our main character, famously says, I volunteer as tribute. And she has a very strong motive for this, and that is to save her sister. Um, but very importantly, this is an event that is very, very rare. You know, the rest of the characters are forced into this tournament because it's it's pretty difficult, I think, to get, you know, enough participants that are willingly going to join a tournament like this. The whole volunteering works in The Hunger Games because it's just Katniss who does it. You know, it's like a rare thing and it shows that she's different. She really cares. Another good example is actually Squid Game, in which the participants are forced into this deadly game, free-for-all game, where if you win, you get a lot of money. The thing about Squid Game is that the fact that people are going to die is kind of vague. You know, when people are invited into this game, they don't know a lot about it. They're usually not aware that people are actually going to die if they lose. So they're more likely to, to join because they don't actually know that it's a death tournament. But then when the main character finds out that people die, or when all of the characters find out that people die, they still stay there. Most of the people that are participating are in very, very big debt or have very strong financial problems and this kind of fits with the whole point of the show which was to show how desperate people get uh, when they are in debt and how hopeless a life can seem when you have financial troubles to the point that you are willing to put yourself in a, a ridiculous situation like a death tournament just for the chance of getting some money. You're even willing to become a killer. Now an example of a bad, a book that does this badly, this is just, I just want to make this video because I want to rant about this book. We have here Immortal Longings by Chloe Gong. <laughs> it is a fantasy book where people have the ability to jump between bodies so they can like take over other people's bodies and then like 
use that body for themselves and then jump back into their own body. Uh, and there is another death tournament organized by the like evil king that doesn't care about his civilians. People fight each other, kill each other, and if you win, you get a wish from the king. Is it a wish or just a lot of money? Anyway, you get something from the king. He gives you something. Now, one of our main characters, Kala, joins this tournament and her motivation for this is as follows she wants to kill the king because she hates him and he doesn't properly care for the citizens he doesn't care about these citizens he keeps them poor just lets them die out on the street and she hates him for it so she wants to kill the king okay motivation clear right there but because the winner of the death tournament gets close to the king during like the winner ceremony she wants to win the death tournament so she can like have a chance at killing him which means that kala is willing to risk dying she's willing to kill all these other dozens of participants just to get close to the king during the winning ceremony surely there's another way I feel like this is, in fact, not the path of least resistance. Also, the reason that she wants to kill the king is because he treats his citizens poorly. So Kala is willing to kill multiple citizens during this tournament so she can punish the king for not caring about the citizens? Again, I feel like there are other ways. <laughs> Another thing that happens in this book is that as a participant, you can be disqualified if you lose your participation bracelet. Uh, so at some point, someone tries to kill Kala by stealing her participation bracelet instead of killing her so that she will be disqualified after 24 hours. To which I immediately thought, why doesn't everyone do that? Why does everyone choose so easily to just kill when they could also steal each other's bracelets. One of my pet peeves in stories is when authors overlook the extreme hurdle of killing others. When authors just completely understate how big of a deal it is to choose to start killing as a person and just all of the characters in the fantasy story are just suddenly so eager to kill and i'm like i feel like you should maybe explore this a little bit more of course i cannot read the author's mind but it definitely feels like the author is just putting these characters in a death tournament situation just because it's cool just for the free stakes and tension and without actually understanding the political and societal implications of a death tournament which kind of brings me to the second thing of what makes for a good death tournament and that is that the death tournament should say something about the world whether that is the fictional world that the author has created or as like a metaphor for our world this is a, a quote that i found to be honest on like a random forum <laughs> Uh, from writers trying to write death tournaments. Great source, but I just really agreed with the, what this user Swamp said. I think a good death game often reflects a very real conflict. Battle Royale was about cutthroat academia and the horrible effects on young people. Squid Game shows the desperation death can leave you in, where even probable death is worth just a chance at getting away from it. Good examples of how death tournaments say something about the world, again, is the Hunger Games. I just love the Hunger Games. I'm always, always going to talk about the Hunger Games. In the Hunger Games, the Hunger Games itself say something about this fictional world. It just shows the dynamic between the capital, the, all these rich people in the capital, versus the workers in the district that nobody cares about. But it's also in many different ways a metaphor for our society. It shows how workers are pitted against each other, making each other their enemy instead of their boss or their authori- author why can't I say this word? Authorial figure. Authorial figure. Great. <laughs> the people of the districts are pitted against each other, so they make each other into enemies instead of seeing the real enemy, which is the capital. Just like how workers can be pitted against each other, so they don't um, 
unionize, basically. <laughs> Susan Collins was also very inspired by reality TV, talking about how spectators often don't care about the well-being of the people in the reality TV shows, as long as it's entertaining. The Hunger Games Death Tournament has very, very clear messages about our society and also builds the world of the Hunger Games. Another good example, in my opinion, maybe controversial, is actually The Serpent and the Wings of Night. This is like a fantasy romance book, and I know fantasy romance is often kind of looked down upon as not having great world building or anything. And I'm not saying that this book is like a masterpiece, it's really not, but I do think I, well, first of all, it's just really fun. It's a really fun book. <laughs> but I think the death tournament in this book also works really well because of the world building in this book. It doesn't have any kind of political message. It's very clearly just kind of there for the funsies and the stakes and the tension. But it works because of the world building. And I'll explain. So, <laughs> in the world of the Serpent and the Wings of Night, we follow the only human girl that lives among this country of vampires. And the realm is literally ruled by the goddess of death, who the vampires all worship very devoutly. And there's this tournament being organized where all of the vampires go against each other in trials, usually killing each other, and the one winner will win a wish from this goddess. This death tournament very clearly says a lot about the world. Not only are we dealing with vampires, they like a good dangerous fight a little bit more than the average human. They're not afraid to kill. They have a completely different set of morals and rules. And in this world, this death tournament is also shown to an audience of people who are like enjoying watching it because, you know, they're vampires and they just enjoy watching other vampires kill each other. They enjoy the bloodshed. And secondly, the country literally worships the goddess of death. I feel like a tournament to the death kind of fits that vibe, you know? It kind of fits. It shows how these vampires worship literal death. And I'm gonna give another bad example, in my opinion, from this book, Immortal Longings by Chloe Gong. Um, so I said that in this book, the magic system surrounds body jumping. So people can like jump, take over someone else's body, which is technically illegal, but people do it all the time, especially during this death tournament. Because you know, if someone's trying to kill you, you just jump into someone else's body and fight with that body so that when someone kills you, they don't actually kill your body, they, you, they just killed someone else super useful. It means that people who cannot jump are constantly running the risk of getting jumped into, having their bodies displaced, or worse, having their bodies being used in violent duels and potentially even being killed. And throughout the book, the main characters are constantly using the bodies of other random nameless characters to fight and run around in, which I think creates a very clear power dynamic between people who can jump and people who don't jump. Which is something that would be wonderful to reflect in this death tournament, but just doesn't really happen. So the death tournament takes place not in like an arena or an island or a theater, but just in the city among all the other citizens. It just happens on the streets. Which means <laughs> that you have this like group of like, what, 30, 50, 100, I don't know, a bunch of people that are actively trying to kill each other, that are having violent fights among citizens, and they're also constantly jumping into random citizens' bodies to try to kill each other, which means that there are a lot of civilian casualties. And yet, we are supposed to believe this tournament is great entertainment and that people love watching it on the TV. Like, when I talked about this book uh, with my Patreon book club, we were all kind of like, if I lived there, I would be terrified. I wouldn't enjoy watching that tournament. I would live in constant fear of going outside because some of the participants of the tournament could jump into my body and use it to get into a deadly fight. Like, that doesn't sound like something I would find fun and entertaining at all. So you have these participants that have willingly joined this tournament in which they are happily 
killing off civilians, disrupting the city. And yet we're supposed to believe that the civilians are enjoying watching this tournament for entertainment. I feel like the author kind of lacked understanding of the power dynamic that this creates between these two groups and the power dynamic that are usually there when you have someone watching someone else for entertainment, as we talked about at the beginning. And this is why I think good death tournament stories have something to say. Something to say about the world building, something to say about the real world, some kind of message. Not because I think every story needs a message. I think there are plenty of great stories who don't have some kind of message. But because if you're writing a story where people are willingly joining a fight to the death or forced into a fight to the death, there needs to be some good explanation for that. The author needs to show understanding for what it means to their world if one group of people likes to watch another group of people kill each other for sports. Like how the boxing battle royales in America showed how black people were still seen as inferior by white people. The gladiator duels where prisoners and slaves were pitted against animals for the enjoyment of spectators as an execution method said something about how prisoners and slaves were seen as inferior in ancient Rome. And I think that's what makes for a good death tournament if the author understands that you can't just use it as free stakes and tension but that a story trope like that comes with some baggage it comes with some need for understanding what kind of world you need to create for a death tournament to exist in it that was my ramble i hope you enjoyed my ramble <laughs> If there is any other trope you would like me to do a deep dive on, I've done the not like other girls trope, I've done the fake dating trope, I've done the enemies to lovers trope. If there's any other tropes that you think could make for an interesting deep dive, please do let me know in the comments. And if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one and want to see more videos about books, uh, do subscribe. Don't forget to use this exclusive code to buy the FlexiSpot E7 now for the best price. A big thank you to all of my Patreons for supporting me with a very special shout out to all of my elite Patreon members whose names you see here. If you join my Patreon, you get access to my book club and this month we are reading A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed, which I am so, so excited about. Uh, so I will also leave that in the description if you want to join that. Um, that being said, I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you soon with another video very soon next week. All right, goodbye.